On August 12, 2025, a Vans RV7A, tail number November 30 Sierra Golf, went down at Ryan Field near West Glacier, Montana, killing the only pilot on board. What should have been just another routine landing attempt turned into tragedy after two bounced landings, a go-around, and then a fatal collision with a tree right off the side of the runway. Now, the NTSB hasn't released its final report yet, so we don't have all the answers, but in this early analysis, I want to dig into what challenges might have come together that day, and more importantly, what lessons pilots can take from this accident. Here's what we know from the preliminary report and local coverage. The airplane was a Vans RV 7A, registered to Nevada Flyboys LLP out of Minden, Nevada. Around 1.25 in the afternoon, the pilot took off from Kalispell City Airport, that's about 30 miles away, and flew toward Ryan Field. A DSB data shows the aircraft circled the area multiple times before trying to land. The weather was about as good as you can ask for in Montana in August. Clear skies, 10 miles of visibility, no wind to speak of, and temperatures in the high 80s Fahrenheit. So, weather doesn't appear to have been a factor. The trouble began with the first landing attempt. Witnesses said the plane bounced twice on touchdown before the pilot added power and went around. On the radio, the pilot mentioned his oil temperature was high and said he was going to fly around to cool the engine before trying again. Then came the second attempt, and again, the airplane bounced. The pilot tried to go around one more time, but this time the right wing clipped a tree about 55 feet off the ground. From there, the RV rolled inverted and slammed into the ground nose first, ending up just 100 feet west of the runway center line. Sadly, the pilot did not survive. Now let's talk about Ryan Field itself because this is one of those strips that looks absolutely beautiful on a map, but it can really challenge you in the cockpit. It's a remote grass airstrip owned and operated by the Recreational Aviation Foundation. Pilots love it because it's tucked right near Glacier National Park, but it's not exactly forgiving. Runway 15, the one the pilot was using, is turf. Grass strips are tricky. Braking effectiveness is lower, the surface isn't perfectly smooth, and the sight picture during landing can be deceiving. You can be carrying more speed than you realize, and that's often when those nasty bounces happen. On top of that, Ryan Field is surrounded by trees, and this isn't just scenery, those trees are real, physical obstacles sitting just off the edge of the runway. That means if your approach isn't stable, or if your go-around isn't aggressive and clean, you don't have much room to recover. Even with a strong engine, draggy flap settings, hot summer temperatures, and Montana's density altitude can all combine to rob you of climb performance right when you need it most. The frustrating part is that everything looks fine on paper. Clear skies, calm winds, a well-maintained RV-7A, but the environment itself leaves you very little margin for error. When you look at the sequence of events, the pilot's actions give us some important lessons. Both landings ended in a bounce, and that usually points to energy mismanagement. Maybe carrying just a little too much speed, or struggling to judge the flare on grass. On a paved runway, you might get away with that once or twice. On grass, especially at a strip like Ryan Field, those mistakes compound quickly. Now, the real kicker is what happened during the go-around. Witnesses reported the airplane climbing out with flaps still extended. In a Vans RV 7A, that's a big deal. This airplane has plenty of performance, but if you don't clean up the flaps promptly, at least to an intermediate setting, you're dragging a parachute behind you. Climb performance drops dramatically, and suddenly those trees off the side of the runway look a lot taller. Then there's the oil temperature call. The pilot reported it was high, which may or may not have been an actual mechanical issue. But here's the thing. Even if the engine was making full power, and witnesses said the RPMS sounded normal, that distraction alone could make a pilot hesitate to push the throttle to the wall during a go-around. It's one of those subtle human traps. You've got a technical concern nagging at the back of your mind, and it pulls focus away from the precise, aggressive control inputs you need to escape danger. So, if there are mistakes to learn from here, they're the kind of mistakes any one of us could make. 
delaying a go-around after a bounce, leaving too much flap in the climb, or fixating on an engine gauge when the real fight is with altitude and obstacles. This is where we zoom out a little. The RV-7A is an amazing airplane, fast, aerobatic, efficient, but it's also an experimental, amateur-built design. That means no two airplanes are exactly alike, and it demands very precise handling. Accident data shows RVS are overrepresented in bounced landing and go-around accidents. That's not because they're unsafe, but because they'll expose sloppy technique fast. Human factors, though, may be the bigger piece of this puzzle. Imagine being in that cockpit. You've already bounced once, you're on your second attempt, the oil temp gauge is glaring at you, and you know there's a line of trees sitting just off the runway. That pressure, the I have to get this airplane on the ground mentality is real. It's the kind of pressure that can override the safer option of just breaking off and diverting to a big paved strip nearby. And honestly, that's one of the hardest calls in general aviation, swallowing your pride, admitting the field is beating you, and taking the safer exit. And we have to say this, go-arounds are supposed to be a safety maneuver, but they're actually one of the riskiest phases of flight in GA. Studies have shown that accidents often happen not because the pilot didn't initiate a go-around, but because the maneuver itself wasn't executed cleanly. Wrong configuration, late throttle, or simply underestimating how much climb gradient you need. That's exactly the type of trap Ryan Field can set. Now before anyone gets too confident about theories, let's step back. There's still a lot we don't know, and the NTSB will dig into all of this in the final report. For one, the pilot's identity hasn't been released, so we don't know his training background, total hours, or time and type. That's huge context missing. There are also technical questions. Was that high oil temperature just the normal behavior of this particular engine on a hot day? Or was there a cooling system problem? Exactly what flap setting was left in during the climb out? Was the airplane loaded near its weight or balance limits? And how much did density altitude really factor into the climb performance that day? These are the kinds of details we can't answer right now. What we can say is that this tragedy shows just how quickly a routine landing attempt can spiral into a no-win situation. One bounce leads to another, stress builds, decisions pile up, and suddenly the margin for error is gone. At the end of the day, the pilot lost his life here, and we need to talk about this accident with respect. The point of analyzing isn't to criticize, it's to learn. And the one thing that stands out right now is how unforgiving unstable landings and go-arounds can be, especially at strips with trees, grass, and density, altitude, all working against you. So I'll leave you with this question. What do you think was the biggest factor in this crash? Was it the challenging airfield itself, the distraction of the oil temperature, or flap management during the go-around? Drop your thoughts in the comments, and if you want to see updates when the final NTSB report comes out, make sure to subscribe.